presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Paul's. Welcome to St. Paul's United Methodist Church, where we have been making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world since 1824. We're a mission-oriented family serving God and community in the Wesleyan tradition for 200 years. Worship liturgy will be on the screen, and hymnals are available if you prefer having music uh, for your hymns. Only the words appear on the screen. If you have a question or need assistance, please speak with an usher. Today's radio broadcast on WMSG 1050 AM and WKTZ 95.9 FM is sponsored by an anonymous listener in appreciation of the radio broadcast. So thank you, anonymous listener. Some reminders, uh, Lenten lunch is this Wednesday, the, tw uh, the 28th in the fellowship hall. Um, and the guest speaker will be at 1 p.m., 12 to one. And the guest speaker will be Barbara, Reverend Barbara Rex Road. Um, and all the items for the February 28th Lenten luncheon have been donated. Uh, please watch for the clipboard as it comes around for March 6th. Congratulations is in order. Shirley Knowles and Jan Naylor have joined together as lifelong partners this past Saturday, having been together for 27 years. We wish them much happiness. Uh, the Mission 200 Project. So 200, why? Because it's our 200th anniversary. So as everybody I think knows, we're collecting uh, soup, canned package or boxes of soup, and they can be left in the uh, basket in the narthex or in the banner on the stage, under the banner on the stage in the fellowship hall. Um, Easter lilies, Easter lilies will be decorating an altar for, uh, in celebration of the resurrection of life. Um, there is a, you can fill out the form if you would like to have flowers in memory of or in honor of or in celebration of a person and those will be $12 each. Um, the radio broadcasts, so uh, broadcasts every Sunday at 1045 and there are several dates available in March and April if you feel led to support the radio ministry and it's $110. Pennies for Missions, uh, Burlington United Methodist Family Services, and that's the Pennies for Missions this month, and it goes to helping children in West Virginia and Western Maryland. Also, the Share the Warmth campaign continues. Um, we need adult uh, items, winter items, scarves, gloves, hats, uh, coats, and those things will be uh, placed at locations through March the 31st. And also important to the mission and ministry of this church are our donations and our tithes, our offerings. And we have several ways to do that by offering, by placing your offering in the plate at the door as you enter and leave the worship by going online to www.stpaulsoakland.com and clicking donations, and which you can give online that way through PayPal or Tithely or by sending a check or bringing your offering into the church during the week. And the address is St. Paul's, 318 East Oak Street, Oakland, Maryland, 21550. Any other announcements this morning? All right, let us prepare our hearts for worship as Kendra leads us in our prelude.
The season of Lent is the season of Lent is a time when we can face up in a to when we can face up to and accept responsibility for our mistakes and shortcomings. A time when we can focus on returning to God through the sacred story of the prodigal son. In her book, Christ Beside Me, Christ Within Me, Beth Richardson says, "We have come to a place of decision that may change the course of a t- may change the course of a life." May God's love be in our hearts. May God's courage be in our spirits. May God's guidance be in our considerations. We have come to a place of decision that may change the course of a life. May our struggling and discernment find its blessing in the divine. May the Holy One guide our thoughts, our words, and our steps. May Jesus lead us on this journey and bless our past. Our act of worship this season of Lent begins and ends with, Come, let us return to the Lord. Please stand and join responsibly in the call to worship. Come, let us celebrate the forgiving, reconciling love of God. Know that God's love has know that God's love is lavished upon you forever. Come, let us celebrate and praise the God of love. Come, let us worship. 
Please continue standing and join singing, Calm Thou Fount of Every Blessing. As we walk the way of the cross, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please offer signs of peace and love to those around you. Please be seated. As we prepare to pray together, Let's sing verse one of Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. together. Almighty God, through love you have made us, and for love you call us to repentance. Grant that we who seek to mend our sinful ways may find strength in your compassion and forgiveness. Restore us the joy of your salvation. Give us the Holy Spirit that we may serve you with willing hearts bearing witness to your abundant mercy in all the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. One characteristic of the Lenten season is that it is introspective and involves careful self-examination. As we continue in prayer, silently consider those things which distract you, which pull your attention from God, those places where you are vulnerable to the daily demands of life and are too rushed to care or too tired to bother.
Centered in the gracious gracious presence of God, we continue in prayer. Trusting the grace you promise to us in Jesus, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, Lord, Lord, prodigal son, we stray from you this day. Call us back to your loving embrace. If like the elder son, we harbor resentment for the grace you give to others, reprove us. Help us claim in thought and deed the inheritance of the saints who share with Jesus compassion and forgiveness to all who lose their way. Amen. Amen. Having confessed our sin, we receive God's gracious response of forgiveness. As a parent welcomes home a wayward child, so God embraces all who return in true repentance. In the name of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Continue in prayer. Are there any joys and concerns that you wish to share today? Uh, Andy? My uh, nephew uh, got operated on Friday for cancer in his home. Uh, he went through the surgery very well and he may get home so today or tomorrow. Successful surgery. Thank you, Andy. John? I'd like to uh, offer a prayer for my wife. Betty Ross Wilmot is going to have reverse shoulder surgery tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Okay, so we wish Betty well in her surgery tomorrow. Any others this morning? Yes. Thank you, Ann. It's great to see everyone here today. All right, let's go to the Lord. Gracious God, who speaks to us in a still, small voice or a compassionate act, we are filled with relief and expectation that you hear our prayers of joy. We're thankful for Andy's nephew and his successful surgery, and also for Sharon that she's back with us today. And the promise that you and your goodness and mercy will follow us in the days of our lives and bring us closer to you. Lord, we ask that you will be close with Betty in her surgery tomorrow. In the name of the one who brings us home to you, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And now, let us pray the prayer which gives us a vision of the life Jesus invites each of us to experience with him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now if the children would like to come forward, we'll have Jesus loving them. Good morning. How are you two? Good? Excellent. So we've got a lot to cover. Are you guys, uh, you guys awake? Have you been paying attention? I'm not awake. Not awake? <laughs> you no? Know, well, I'm not really either. Gwyneth is having a hard time as well. 
But do you remember last week, Mr. Mother, and we, and we talked about wishes and things like that? Well, we're going to continue today. So let me ask you this. Have you ever been lost? Sometimes. Did your dad ever get you lost? Is he, will he admit it? No. He does. He gets, gets you lost. Yeah. I, I think there's something intrinsically mechanical in us, the dads, right, that will not permit us most times to admit that we're lost, right? Let me ask another question. Um, have, you ever, have you ever done something that maybe has disappointed a friend or your sibling or a parent, you think? Or are you guys pretty good, pretty, pretty good about that, pretty, pretty conscious? Yeah, anybody, anybody ever done something that maybe disappointed? Yeah, right? What, what do we typically do when we've done that? Cry. Cry? Yeah, yeah. Do you ever, you, ever, you ever say sorry? Yeah, yeah. So getting lost, I'm going to circle back around. I'm all over the place, but bear with me here. So getting lost can mean a lot of things, right? We can be geographically lost, right? We can be lost uh, mentally, right? We're, we're just concerned with what's going on in our lives that we maybe aren't paying attention. Uh, you know, sometimes it, it happens in here. We're thinking about going to the grocery store or the other things we have to do, right? Those things. Or the, maybe we're going to a party later, that kind of stuff. And sometimes we can get lost from God, right? So, so today, um, we're going to learn, and again, in the scripture, we talked about the prodigal son last week. We're going to hear more about the prodigal son today. And, um, you know, he gets lost. He goes and does his own thing for a little bit, right? And he has this money, and he has these friends, and he turns his back on God because he's preoccupied with what's going on in his life. He's having a lot of fun, traveling, spending money, living lavishly. And once the money runs out, these folks that he thought were his friends aren't really his friends. They leave, right, and turn their backs on him. And he's hungry, and he goes to work and feeds pigs. And he's so hungry that he considers eating what the pigs eat. Can you imagine being that hungry? Yeah? And he thinks about this, and he thinks, and he thinks, you know something? I am going to go back to my father, and I am going to go to work for him as his servants are not hungry. They have food, and I'll work for him. And he returns to his father, and his father sees him in the distance, and his father doesn't even have to wait for his son to come back. He's already happy, and he's ready to embrace him in his arms and be joyous that his son is home. What does that remind you of? Who does that remind you of? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, right, and God. So that's the one thing about getting lost is spiritually, is we can turn around and we can go back to God. And if we ask him and tell him that we're sorry, he'll forgive us, won't he? And he'll open us, open his arms to us and love us, right? All right, well, that's excellent. Let us pray. Dear God, we're so grateful that even when we lose our way sometimes, when we turn back, and ask you, you forgive us, and you love us, and you will love us always, under no conditions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. of Luke's Gospel, begins with verses 1 to 3, and then we read 11 to 20a. And our sacred story today is, again, as Harry was saying, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. And today, Gwyneth is going to read the part that we had last week, just to keep us all in the loop. And then I'll read the part for this week. And as always, we invite you to read the parts in bold. One day when many tax one day, many tax collectors and other outcasts came to listen to Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law started grumbling. This man welcomes outcasts. Oh. 
even eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was once a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. He went to a country far away where he wasted his money in reckless living. He had spent everything when a bad famine spread through that whole land. Soon he had nothing to eat. He went to work for a man in that country, and the man sent him out to take care of his pigs. He would have been glad to eat what the pigs were eating, but no one gave him a thing. Finally, he came to his senses and said, The younger son got up and started back to his father. This is a witness to the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our song response is, Precious Lord, take my hand. You may be seated. And will you pray with me? Spirit of life, God of love, open our hearts and enter in as we seek to hear your good news to us this day. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God who leads us home. Amen. Disillusionment is the loss of illusion about ourselves, about the world, about God, says Barbara Brown Taylor in her book, The Preaching Life. She goes on to say, while it is almost always painful, it is not a bad thing to lose the lies we have mistaken for truth. Disillusioned, we find out what is not true and are set free to seek what is, if we dare. For many years, uh, a movie that Mark and I have watched during this Lenten season is The Devil Wears Prada, in which Meryl Streep plays this diabolical boss named Miranda Priestly, the editor of a high-profile fashion magazine called Runway. And a young woman, Andrea Sachs, played by Anne Hathaway, fresh out of college with a professional dream of becoming a journalist, lands a job working for Miranda and Runway a job that she hopes will quickly build up her resume so that she can move on to more serious journalism. And as the movie progresses, viewers see Andy work her way up from coffee girl and pencil sharpener to Miranda's number one assistant. And she does so by passing multiple demanding, seemingly impossible, thankless tests set by the ruthless editor-in-chief and by changing her outward appearance so that she will fit in with Miranda and with others in the industry. As the film progresses, we become aware that this job for which her boss believes Andy is a natural like herself is nearly the emotional death of her. For Andy loses close friends, family, boyfriend, a sense of who she is and her direction in life as she serves Miranda mindlessly, night and day. But she valiantly does so because she is filled with the illusion that it is what she needs to do to achieve her goals. 
that is to become her authentic self. Now, toward the end of the film, as Andy rides with Miranda to an event, finally disillusioned by all that she has experienced living in Miranda's world, the two talk about whether or not it's worth it, this celebrity life that Miranda leads. For Miranda's marriage has failed, her children behave like spoiled brats, and her competitors have plotted behind her back, attempting to betray her. Miranda looks at Andrea in disbelief and says, don't be silly, everyone wants this. Everyone wants to be us. With few illusions left of this supposedly glamorous life that Miranda believes that her assistant has sold her soul for, Andy decides wisely that she does not want it for herself. And so as Miranda exits the car into a sea of photographers expecting her assistant to follow, Andrea makes her own exit away from the seductive life that has taken her into a metaphorical distant country, far from the foundational relationships of home, family, friends, in which she had experienced both grace and a sense of belonging. And set free, she is suddenly wistful for life, for all that she has previously valued before her rise to power at the magazine. So at this point in the movie, while she misses the way things were, Andy is uncertain as to whether or not her parents, her old friends, boyfriend, will welcome her back into these former relationships that she's devastated. But hopeful, she begins her return by seeking to make amends with those that she has hurt, willing to settle for less than what the relationships previously were aware that it will be up to them to accept or reject her attempts at reconciliation. A broken young woman, her illusion shattered. Andy is aware that she may never again have a job as good as the one that she had with Miranda. She may have to be content with a life that has less, less financial resources, less glamour, less professional recognition a life devoid of the very success, power, and wealth that she's grown to crave, a life that suggests an entirely different notion of what it means to belong. At the heart of today's segment of the parable of the prodigal son is a young man grappling with disillusionments that are similar to those of Andreas, dissatisfied with the upbringing he had on the ancestral farm of his family, he had left behind home and family and friends, and in his case, faith, for the temptations, the illusions of a more glamorous life, and went off to a distant country to live a life he felt would offer him the opportunity to be his best self. Now, we imagine he did so because some compelling voice or voices had told him that there in that distant country, he could discover and experience genuine belonging. And as we listen to today's part of his venture in this country far away from his home, we realize that his dreams to find this authentic self without the interference of parents or older brother or neighbors or religious leaders at the local temple have begun to fade. Having destroyed these relationships in favor of reckless living, driven by the emotions of greed, power, pride, arrogance, as we tune in to what has happened to him since he has left home and all that was familiar, we sense that this younger son feels empty inside, lost, lonely, and we can hear that he is totally feeling the loss of privilege. As he's processing these feelings, this younger son in the parable struggles to figure out where and with whom he belongs. And if that's not enough in itself, we are challenged to acknowledge that since he renounced his ties to homeland, family, and religious heritage, as suggested by his work with the pigs, the younger son is, in essence, a non-person to those who are listening to Jesus, to the religious leaders and scholars of the law to whom Jesus is telling this parable. He is one without social or legal status. 
As Jesus tells the story of the younger son whose life derailed so thoroughly in a distant land, his audience is thinking things like this. What did he expect? You know, how many religious laws did he break? The list is long. You know, he mistreated his father, asking for his inheritance, a portion of the ancestral land before his father was dead. And if that wasn't offensive enough, what did he do? He sold off that land in order to leave home and family and fund an outlandish lifestyle in a distant country. They go on to say he was raised on the same teachings as the rest of the community. He should have known that he couldn't outrun those teachings forever. He should have known that his reckless living would eventually catch up with him. How naive, they think, to believe that as wasteful as he has been, that his resources and his fortune would last forever. Now, imagine the inflexible attitude of this audience when Jesus comes to the portion of the parable in which he shares this. Penniless and no longer able to look at himself in the mirror, the younger son comes to the conclusion that instead of staying on as hired help to a Gentile, a non-Jewish farmer, he'll just go home. He'll go home to the family farm and just get a job there. For the laborers on his dad's farm always had plenty to eat. So he'd never be without food. Just imagine what the reaction is of those listening when they hear this younger son's plans. Now, while the younger son sees this as a workable solution to his problem, they are thinking his present predicament is precisely what he deserves and that he should just take his medicine, remain lost to his family. You know, in no way, in their minds, can he ever again go home. For no self-respecting Hebrew father would put out the welcome mat for him, because in essence, he's dead to him. So what a shock it is to the religious leaders when this parable of Jesus takes a surprise twist. And they're told that the younger son is returning home for what once again sounds as if he is going to try and take advantage of perhaps his father's lingering love for him. Now, if we're the suspicious sort, we too will question the younger son's motives for returning home. For clearly, there's no indication that he's going with the hope of reconciling with his father and the family, is there? He's going so he will not starve. And on the surface, it appears to be one more selfishly motivated move by him. But here's what I want us to think about before we go down this rabbit hole. Anyone who has ever had to eat their stubborn pride, whether in a family or a professional situation, understands some of the thoughts and fears that must have been going through the mind of this disillusioned younger son, who knows that when he left home, he left behind him extensive emotional baggage and heartache. So I believe he's left in a sea of anxiety as he weighs the pros and the cons of returning home, heart pounding, short of breath, stomach hurting, unable to get a good night's sleep, panic, filling every inch of his body. He wonders if his father and other family members will refuse to welcome him back home. Will they reject his request to live and to work with the hired laborers? Will his father humiliate him for the shameful manner in which he left home? We all know what anxiety can do to us physically and emotionally until it's resolved. And so the younger son begins to think about workable solutions. And here's what he comes up with. He can knock on the door of the family home that he left so abruptly and see if his father will talk with him and hear that things did not turn out the way that he had hoped they would, that he is no longer in a position to take care of himself and his most basic needs that his search for freedom, power, success, for self-worth, for belonging, has been in all the wrong places. 
that he has become disenchanted, disheartened, disillusioned with life in the distant country. And he has been left with this strong sense of not belonging anywhere. And in addition to these, he can say to his dad that he has sinned against God and him and is unworthy to be called son, to be treated as a family member in good standing and would be fine with being treated as one of the workers. See, these are the possible solutions which come to his mind. He hopes against hope that his father will hear how his illusions have been shattered and feel some compassion toward him and welcome him back home as a hired laborer. Disillusionment is the loss of illusion about ourselves, about the world, about God. And while it is almost always painful, it is not a bad thing to lose the lies that we have mistaken for truth. Disillusioned, we find out what is not true and are set free to seek what is, if we dare. So the good folks at the temple who hear this portion of Jesus' story are challenged to recognize the resilience and freedom that can grow out of disillusionment and how it can be a game changer for us when God meets us in the middle of it, reminding us that there is a place called home, however we define it, which when we return to it holds the expectation of welcome and an experience of grace, a doorway into genuine belonging. So in this part of the parable, Jesus challenges his listeners to let go of their illusions about fathers and sons, parents and children, about God's kingdom, about who rightfully belongs in the family and who doesn't. See, in this part of the parable, Jesus begins to lead his listening audience to the scandalous grace that is available to all. Even before we consciously recognize it or deserve it, he's doing so as he shares with them these words. He, the younger son, started home to his father. United Methodists know this as God's prevenient grace, a grace that is with us from birth, going ahead of us before we even know it, preparing us to recognize and accept the new life that is offered to us through God's unlimited love for us. In this season of Lent, as we walk toward Jerusalem and Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, it is this act that makes prevenient grace possible. Now, using a house as a metaphor, because that's the common one used, prevenient grace, the love of God that is in each and every one of us before we even know it, prevenient grace is the porch. And when we are on the porch, we prepare to enter a house. Prevenient grace then prepares our hearts and minds to hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and to respond in faith, that is, to enter the door of the house. At times, we unknowingly distance ourselves from this grace. But then, when over the course of time, we become disillusioned with the choices we have made, and we begin to look for ways to return home, it is this grace that leads us, that takes us to the place where we belong, See, prevenient grace holds out the promise of welcome and possibility for us when we have wandered away, for, for those times when we are filled with an awareness that relationships and actions and words are not the way that they're supposed to be. So I want to share with you this morning a story. I don't know if I shared it with you before, honestly, but it's a timeless story about prevenient grace, and it is one of my favorites. So I pulled it out of my file. It was shared on NPR's Morning Edition by uh, Michael Garofalo. It's about a 31-year-old New York City social worker named Julio Diaz. And Garofalo noted that Diaz customarily 
followed the same routine each evening in his lifetime, ending his hour-long subway commute to the Bronx one stop early so that he could eat at his favorite diner. And one night, as he stepped off the train and onto a nearly empty platform, he said his evening took an unexpected turn. Walking toward the stairs, he was approached by a teenage boy who pulled out a knife and asked for money. And so Diaz gave the boy his wallet. And as the boy began to walk away, Diaz said, hey, wait a minute, you forgot something. If you're going to be robbing people all night, you might as well take my coat to keep you warm. The young man looked at him like he was crazy, and he wanted to know why he was doing this. And Diaz replied, well, if you're looking to risk your freedom for a few dollars, then I guess you must really need the money. He went on to say, all I wanted to do was get dinner. If you want to join me, hey, you're more than welcome. Because he said that he just felt at that moment that it was a pivotal moment for this young man. And he said, remarkably, the boy agreed. And this unlikely pair walked into the diner, into a booth. And shortly, the manager came by, the dishwasher, some of the waiters, they all came by to greet Diaz. And the kid was like, you know everyone here. Do you own the place? Diaz said, no, I just eat here a lot. The boy said, but you're even nice to the dishwasher. Well, haven't you been taught to be nice to everybody? Yeah, but I didn't think people actually behaved that way. In that moment, the social worker said he saw an opening. He asked the boy what he wanted out of life. The boy was unable to answer. When the bill arrived, Diaz told the boy that he would have to pay the bill because he had the money. But, he said to him, if you give me my wallet back, I'll gladly treat you. And without thinking twice about it, the teen handed over the wallet. Diaz said, so I gave him $20, thinking maybe it would help him. And in return, I asked him for his knife, which he gave to me. Sometimes grace, God's unconditional, unlimited love, so astonishes us that all we can do is change course. All we can do is turn away from that which disillusions us and turn towards that which embraces us and returns us home to God and others and, yes, to ourselves. See, grace, once demonstrated and experienced, changes everything about us. And it brings us to a place of belonging where we can hear the voice of God call out to us, you are my beloved child. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. I have set you free to seek the truth, if you dare. Amen. Maybe there's a chance for me to go back now that I have some direction. It would sure be nice to be back home where there's love and affection. And just maybe I can convince time to slow up, giving me In the Lenten season, we come to worship seeking a shift from the ordinary to the sacred, from doing to being. For this is the time when God nudges us to journey home by, the way, by way of Jerusalem and the cross. As we make this journey, God asks us to be present to God, to listen. 
As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge whatever it is in our world which keeps us from knowing fully the love of God. Will you pray with me? Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, give us strength and courage to make the changes that are needed in our lives so that we may return home to God, open our hearts and minds to your steadfast presence, and grant us an experience of scandalous grace. Amen. Will you stand to receive the benediction? And now go forth in peace, set free to seek the truth if you dare. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing together. This is a day of new beginnings.
presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.